old. And many of them were damaged after landing on makeshift runways in various parts of the country. Are in many cases very damaged. In many cases, um, wouldn't have certain um, numbers, identification numbers, and um, certain things that in the in the aircraft in the aircraft business you need to verify because once they go, get up in the air, um, there are certain things you can't. You can't check as you would on the road, no? And so there's a lot of risk in taking on these aircrafts. And so the best thing for us to do is to take the bids. And um, they've been on the market for some time. And so right now the government is strapped for money. And so we're happy that we finally got rid of them, first of all, out of our lots, and, um, and to actually get some money off of it because we do spend a lot of money capturing them. No? My final question in regards to the aircraft. Um, can you confirm whether these planes were purchased by a Belizean entity or is it someone from outside of the country? Um, I think it's a joint um, venture that purchased them, Belizean and foreigners. The Organization of American States is conducting an investigation to determine the geographical location of a team of Belize Defense Force soldiers who ventured into an area of the adjacency zone in southern Belize near Halakte village. This follows a report from Guatemala Media that the BDF officers illegally entered into a settlement on the Guatemalan side of the border. Today, the CEO of National Security reiterated that the men did not cross into Guatemala and that there are GPS coordinates which admittedly place them very close to the Guatemalan border. This occurrence, says CEO Enriquez, is nothing new where border patrols are concerned. People need to understand that our Patrols, um, the BDF, Belize, administers our side of the adjacency zone. Um, that patrol in particular, and I, I'm saying that because it means that our patrols will go anywhere within the adjacency zone, um, all the way up to the adjacency line, all the way up to the border. Um, and so they could go as close to the border as they want to. It is by doing that that we verify when we have incursions and when we have um, illegal settlement and what have you. Um, the patrol in question went very close, I'll uh, admit, and, um, but our patrols always have a GPS, a calibrated GPS on them. And um, we have been assured that they did not cross the border. So that report is false. No, because it is, the accusation, accusation has been made, uh, we will have the OAS go and verify um, exactly where they were to make it official and say, look, no, they were not in Guatemala. And we've had these kind of misunderstandings more than once. Um, I'm surprised that, you know, the media would make such a big fuss over it because it really is mischievous, no? and it could really affect the relationships that we have with, um, with, with Guatemala while we're seeking a settlement of, of the claim. When you say the media, are you re referring to the local media or are we discussing the Guatemala and the uh, media? Well, well I'm, I'm speaking in general. In this case, it is an international media, um, but you know, there have been occasions previously when we have these occasions that straddle across the Belize and Guatemala border. And, and then because it goes viral, um, it could jeopardize the thought process that the officials are having, you know, because they have to, they have to save face and things like that. The following story also involves the BDF. 
Images of filth that has accumulated at the kitchen at Camp Bel Belisario in Central Farm have been raising concerns for some of the military personnel deployed there. The images show how unsanitary the kitchen is. According to the information, it has gotten worse over the years, and it is still where soldiers would generally have their meals. When we reached out to the BDF today, we were told that they are waiting for pipes to be repaired. News 5 Sapolita Novello reports. On May 26, our newsroom received this message. It reads, this is the kitchen that the BDF soldiers in Central Farm are eating out of. And attached to the message were these pictures and video. The video shows the current state of the kitchen area at Camp Belisario. It's filthy, disgusting and unhealthy. Pots are still on the stove beside the filth that has been festering over the years. It is unsanitary and outright dirty. The walls are plastered with something that can't be healthy. It seems like this area hasn't been cleaned for years. It has been this way for a very long time, another message said. We checked back with our source today and we were told it is still the same. Nothing has changed. The situation has worsened over the years, according to the source. The area near the window looks nasty. The soldiers at Camp Belisario have the option not to eat the food prepared in this kitchen. They can either buy food or have food delivered to them. But when that's not an option, they consume food prepared here. Nobody looks after these soldiers and my fear is that many will get sick, the source told News 5. We reached out to BDF Commander Brigadier General Stephen Ortega and he told News 5 that, quote, we are in the process of moving to another part of the kitchen as the ceiling in that area is damaged, but we have to wait until the person who deals with the gas moves the pipe in order for us to effect the necessary repairs, unquote. The question now is, how much longer do the soldiers have to wait? Reporting for News 5, Hippolyta Novello. The main border points remain closed, but illegal border crossings are still taking place because every week we get an update on how many persons are arrested and charged for illegal entry. In the west, at the village of Arenal, which is shared by both Belize and Guatemala, the crossing across the borders is a matter of routine and a part of daily life. The coronavirus pandemic has not put a stop to the illegal activities. But there is growing concern that a case of COVID-19 may have been detected in a Guatemalan town not far from Arenal. It could potentially be imported to this side of the border, and the Ministry of Health is monitoring the situation. News 5's Apolita Novello has the following report. Located on the western border with Guatemala, life in Arenal village continues as normal. Villages are just crossing the border um, to, to do continue to participate in um, illegal and contraband issues. The village lies on the border and half of it is on the Belize side. Director of Health Services Dr. Marvin Manzanaro expressed his concern to News 5 about the seemingly easy flow of persons crossing the border in Arenal. It is concerning not only because Guatemala is experiencing a spike in positive COVID-19 cases, but also because reports have surfaced of a possible case in a nearby Guatemalan town. There is a note, although we have not been able to confirm that there was a case in, in the neighboring town, um, um, that's where the concern has to be. The people are now live their daily life as if though there's no border. They intermingle and buy goods from the Guatemala side routinely. But change must occur. CEO in the Ministry of National Security, Felix Enriquez, says that BDF patrols have increased in the area. We have a regular patrol out there, BDF and police. And we've actually stepped up our routine patrols in the area um, from the BDF side in Arenal and in the region of Arenal. Um, but like you said, that community is a tricky one because the community is such that it is like families living from one side to the next. You know? And um, what we have to do is educate them. And we have to make sure that our education process reach the families that are on the Belize side, but as well as those across. Uh, and we have sent um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs leading an effort to an educate for an education process that is taking place in Arenal and in surrounding villages, in fact, in all the villages um, in the border area. I, I think there's been an attempt to increase the, the patrols and, and, and surveillance at that community level, but um, I, I don't have the full details of what else has been done to try to do you believe that the reason for this is the flow of traffic between the border there in Arenal by Belizeans and Guatemalans is because of lack of information received on their part? 
Um, my understanding is that there has been an educational process at the community level in a language that they would understand. But uh, I mean, I'm not trying to justify it, but also understand that that is a uh, part of their daily routine. And it's for that reason that members of the community play a crucial role in effecting a change in Arenal. We also call on the community because it's not only the BDF, and because even if you put up BDF and police, people will still find a way or mechanisms to, to get around. Like people, people find and get creative ways of, of beating the system. So I think it's a community effort as well. Reporting for News 5, Hippolyta Novello. A BDF soldier has been taken to court for rape. The matter reportedly happened a few days ago and the female officer made the complaint. This comes on the heels of a report of irregularities within the force. Tonight we can report that the accused soldier has been charged with rape. He is Margarito Puck who has been in the force for more than 10 years. The female soldier says she was socializing and then went up to her room. She woke up to find she was being raped. Coming up, COVID supplies for the inmates at the central prison and in the downtown area, we'll show you how an establishment is adapting to the new way of business. Oh, how we've missed home. The cool mist on our way to the Keys. The burst of colors underwater. The unmatched marathon of beauty while driving through the hills. Our favorite waiter bringing us that delicious dish. Exceptional guides helping us to connect with our past. Guess what? You don't have to miss home any longer. Home is ready and depending on you. It's time to vacation at home again. Mask on, shoes off, social distancing in mind. Be a Belizean traveler again, cause home is one of a kind. Hello friends, I'm Dr. Bob Roberts with another 60 second sermon from God's Word. The Bible says, and Jesus said unto them, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Most of us are born in valleys surrounded by mountains with no way to look but up. We are born in the valleys of despair, of poverty, of ignorance, and disgrace, and disappointment. And the mountains that have hemmed us in seem to be incapable of being scaled. Only occasionally are we able to climb high enough to get a glimpse of what appears to be on the other side. But even that adds to our despair as we have to descend back down into the valley. I understand this. I never dreamed of going to college or of making a significant contribution to my world because I knew a financial mountain was in my way. However, during my last year in high school, someone came into my life who changed all that. Someone who did not minimize the mountains, but who told me how to remove them. Someone who convinced me uh, that I could make a contribution to my world. Someone who helped me to realize I was confessing my problem instead of claiming my solution. Someone who helped me to realize that if I would but speak faith instead of seeing failure, my mountains would be removed. That someone was Jesus Christ who gave me hope instead of dope, life instead of death, and heaven instead of hell. If you will believe and trust him, he will help you to move the mountains in your life also. Today's 60-second sermon has been presented by Christian Foundations of Faith in cooperation with the Baptist churches in your area. We live in challenging times and understand that you question how to best cope with today's situation. Running W Brand Meat. Got your back, Belize. Effective May 18th, Running W will be lowering prices. Look out for savings on our fresh beef, pork, lamb, and processed products countrywide. That's right, major price cuts and major savings so you can put food on your family's table without sacrificing quality. Now that does great value for your money. Guaranteed lower prices are available at our Running W store in Cayo, Mile 63 on the George Price Highway, Carnivore, 31 Eve Street, Belize City, and Saturdays at the San Ignacio Market. Be 
sure to also check your local grocery store for these special price reductions. Visit our Facebook and Instagram pages, WhatsApp us at 638-8112 or call us at 824-2126 for more information on ways we are helping you save money. Running W Brand Meat remains committed to serving with locals. Allah with a one belief. At the Philip Colson International Airport this morning, a French aircraft touched down, bringing supplies that will be used by inmates at the Belize Central Prison. Prisons are ideal places for the coronavirus to thrive because of congestion and overcrowding. But fortunately so far, local prisons have not logged any case of the virus and the Kobe Foundation wants to keep it that way. The supplies delivered today will give the inmates the precautions to keep the virus away. News 5's Isani Caetano reports. The Belize Central Prison is by and large considered to be an environment where the spread of infectious diseases poses great challenge for agencies working to prevent and control the novel coronavirus. Inmates, according to the World Health Organization, are more susceptible to COVID-19 than the general population because of the cramped conditions in which they live. A sudden outbreak of the pandemic in prison would place immense pressure on Belize's public health system. With that in mind, the CARICOM Implementation Agency for Crime and Security, CARICOM Impacts, along with the British High Commission, donated basic sanitation supplies and other related items to the Colby Foundation. The aircraft we have in front of us is a military, is a French military aircraft, and they were very kind in contributing the freight towards delivering these um, uh, COVID-19 supplies. The supplies that we receive today are things such as uh, N95 masks, uh, disposable masks, uh, hand washing liquid, uh, disinfectant, um, hand sanitizers. Uh, we also got uh, two infrared thermometers to beef up our operations as it relates to screening of COVID, uh, screening for COVID-19 um, disease. Over the past two weeks, CARICOM Impacts and the British High Commission in Port of Spain, Trinidad, have successfully donated supplies to prisons across the Caribbean, including Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados and Dominica. These supplies is definitely going to boost up our operations that we already have in place going on at the prison to mitigate and prevent COVID from entering the prison. The regional security system is a key partner in this partnership by providing airlift and logistical support for the distribution of supplies to CARICOM member states. The French forces in the Caribbean provided airlift of supplies to Belize, the Bahamas and Haiti. CARICOM Impacts is the one that coordinated these supplies and, and that was with the help of the British High Commission in Port of Spain through a fund called the British, the, the, what they call it, the Conflict Stability and, and Security Fund. Uh, so they collaborated and they came through with this very handsome donation of over 7,000 US dollars uh, in terms of um, supplies, COVID-19 supplies for the prison. So um, big thanks to CARICOM, big thanks to the British government for having the Belize Central Prison in mind. The donation of these supplies will encourage and assist with the accelerated adoption of WHO guidelines for prisons and other places of detention, as well as help mitigate the spread of the pandemic and reinforce security within CARICOM. Reporting for News 5, I am Isani Cayetano. Belize has entered its eighth week without recording a positive COVID-19 case. The closure of the PGIA and land borders has kept imported cases away and the work of frontline workers and the Ministry of Health has contributed to the current status. The government had tentatively set July 1st as the day when flights would resume at the international airport. However, those plans have changed and there is no fixed date for the airport to reopen. But as the days go by, businesses continue to lose millions of dollars. Health experts and policymakers are studying the global picture, and there will come a point when the PGIA will need to reopen by striking a balance between health and the economy. 
Director of Health Services Dr. Marvin Manzanero says that whenever the PGIA opens again, the Ministry of Health will have to adjust its strategy. Whenever it opens, I think from the health standpoint, we will do whatever we have to do. Um, it might not be the ideal because I don't think we have the ability to test um, upon arrival. Uh, and it, it, the idea would be to do PCR testing, but then that becomes a logistical nightmare. And also uh, will put your testing ability uh, to, to the test because I don't know how many people are intended to start arriving and then how long before your tests that you have in country um, are depleted. Uh, all those test factors need to be considered. Um, our job is to advise based on what we know and whatever um, happens in, in that light is we, we have to adjust as a Ministry of Health. Would you be able to say whether your advice would be open PGA or the land borders after July 1st? Because is July 1st too soon? I, I don't know that the land borders have been discussed for opening, so that becomes two less headaches, um, if you will. The airport, I know that that uh, has been thrown out as a potential date. Um, there are many things that will have to change between now and then. I don't know how much time we have, but again, if, if they say that's the date, um, although I, uh, there's been discussions um, as to when when the potential date can be, the Ministry of Health, we're going to have to adjust. Last Friday, when we met with other colleagues, we didn't have a straight answer, and I think we were seeking comfort amongst ourselves, I can say that, to try to find a, a, an answer to the questions that keep coming up because we don't have one. But in terms of your professional advice and your knowledge of what's happening, um, would you say that July 1st is, is a date that you had supported? You see, Hippolyte, if you go back to when we had started the discussion, we had said maybe by the end of May we would have had rapid tests on all these mechanisms to try to open in June. But unfortunately, that keeps change, changing. Um, July 1st might not be the ideal date, but then uh, when are you going to open? If you come the last week in June, you still can't find any possible solution for, let's say, delaying it a month. And is it the expectation that when the country reopens to the world that then we would register a new case of COVID-19? More than likely, yes. More than 1,600 COVID-19 tests have been conducted and as of Tuesday afternoon, only two cases were under investigation. Belize continues with zero positive COVID-19 cases and is standing out in the region for this record. At this time, there are no reports of anyone reporting to hospitals or clinics with signs and symptoms of the virus. So in the meantime, health officials are monitoring the region, including our neighbors to the north and west. Director of Health Services, Dr. Marvin Manzanero, explains. But I don't think um, we have patients that are out there circulating currently. And I, even if we are, then we have to be a lucky population that it has continued to propagate itself for more than seven weeks and nobody has shown up at the hospital severely ill. So if you're telling me you have people out there that are having minimal signs and symptoms and walking about, that would be a plus, but I, we, we can't ascertain that. Um, so I don't, I don't think I want to use the term COVID-19 free because as long as it's all around us, um, it, it is going to come at them. But yeah, but I'm saying that since the weeks have passed, no um, new COVID case, it can actually mean that there's no one in Belize with that virus at the moment walking on in public. It would seem to be that there is no active person going around. Yes. Police are looking for two men who are suspects in the murders of a Belizean and a U.S. national at a farm in Hopkins in the Stan Creek District on May 22nd. Theodore Garcia of Hopkins, who goes by the name Chino, is 6 feet 2 inches tall and weighs about 160 pounds, and he's wanted. Police are also appealing for information on the whereabouts of Ryan Brown Foster of Punta Gorda. The construction worker who goes by the name Pity is 5 feet 6 inches in height and weighs 160 pounds. 55-year-old tour guide operator Quentin Espinosa and 70-year-old U.S. citizen Roland Burley were both executed. Espinosa was shot to the forehead while Burley had a gunshot wound to the left side of the head. 
At the scene, police found two 9mm shells. Within days of the gruesome murder, police recovered items stolen from Burley's farm. The public is asking to the public is asked to call the Dangrega police formation at 522-3000 for any information on the suspects. Businesses are finding new ways to provide customers with personal safety. In the downtown area of the city, Debari is one of the attractive places to shop. But due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the business is adapting a feature that will attract customers back to the store. The new norm will now require customers to get disinfected through a mist tunnel when entering the business. Here is News 5's Isani Caetano with this report. The second person in Belize to have succumbed to the novel coronavirus was 63-year-old Conrad Everett. The Belize city resident, along with his family, attended an event at the Plaza Diner in mid-March, when it is believed that he may have contracted the deadly disease at that gathering. Amid an increase in the number of COVID-19 cases in April, the entire country went into mandatory lockdown and, with the gradual reopening of stores and other businesses, proprietor Walter Campos is taking no chances. I think this is a new normal and we have to understand everything changed and we don't know for how long. To me, it's a very good idea to start to use this machine in the door. What he is referring to is a piece of equipment called a mist tunnel. Much like a metal detector, customers are now required to pass through the machine where they are disinfected prior to entering the building. This is a disinfection tunnel and what we have done, we have used um, high grade material for the old doors and it's a misting process that what it does, it mists uh, disinfectant. Um, the product is from hydrogen peroxide mixed with parasitic acid at very, very low concentration but are effective against the coronavirus and um, it's under the EPA list of disinfectants that is approved by the Ministry of Health that we use it to disinfect surface areas and in this case to disinfect um, people that are entering um, into your premises. Located in downtown Belize City, on any given day, there is always heavy foot traffic in the Barry store. The process subjects everyone to stand under the device for a few seconds while they are sprayed from above and on both sides by three mystifiers. It is the first of its kind for any business in the country during these COVID times. I recommend for different kind of business. For, for example, I think the bus terminal needs one machine like this. So many people cross the bus terminal every minute. And then before the, uh, uh, the people reach the bus have to maybe disinfect the whole self. Um, I think the airport needs one machine like this too. All the restaurants. Uh, all. All retail business, I think, have to start to think for buy one machine like this because it's really important. Maybe right now we're free for coronavirus, but we don't know for how long. A mist tunnel at the Philip Goldson International Airport or at various bus terminals across the country does in fact seem practical. On a daily basis, hundreds if not thousands of travelers pass through these facilities. I would like to encourage especially the government to look into something like this, especially to uh, enforce, especially for the, especially like in this case, the repatriated Belizeans that are coming in. It's something that to be looked into so that the disinfection starts from the people coming from the airplanes into our country, the luggage, and even our students. There is also a proposal for a device such as this to be installed at all schools. Manufactured locally from parts that were sourced in Belize, the cost of purchasing a mist tunnel is not prohibitive. It's made to stand the elements of the weather that we have in Belize. And um, the electronics part was a challenge because um, it was something that, you know, we are accustomed to get something from eBay, but because of the foreign currency, to buy things from the U.S. and the freight, it's been challenging for us to get certain items, but we have been working with um, the local suppliers for those electronics, and I'm glad that everything is bought locally so we can make the product here locally. Reporting for News 5, I am Isani Cayetano. After the break, we go back to Maya Center, where Julia Saki has turned the cacao into a zero-waste fruit inside his facility. RFNG Insurance wants you to be prepared for the hurricane season. 
part of that preparation is doing a thorough assessment of your home and other assets. Be sure to take into consideration where your home is located and what it is constructed of. RF&G Insurance Company Limited, where it pays to get it right. Yeah, where the go out? Cool, my dog. Yeah, at the court, at the court. Everybody has that one loyal friend. Brits, you could pick up the girl for me? I can't, I'll check out. I could borrow your tennis. Mm -hmm. Just one pretty please. You could borrow my medication. <sighs> Loyalty doesn't have to be this hard. With Smart's new Stars and Rewards Loyalty Program, prepaid customers get star points easily. Every time you make a call, purchase a bundle or upload credit, you get rewarded. With these points, you can stack them up and get awesome rewards like free data, free SMS, minutes, and extra on uploads plus lots more. So the more you use, the more you get. And if you want to check your reward stars, just download the Smart app, enter the My Account portal, or send a free SMS to Zone. That's 9663. And in the body, write rewards. Then you can enjoy the loyal life. Smart, your full-service telecom provider. The way you watch TV is changing. Now get one app for all your streaming needs. Live sports, live action, global news coverage, local news, 24-hour live, reality TV, and all the TV drama on demand. Your personal cinema, my TV, entertainment, anytime, anywhere. Start your free trial today. Next Gen, powered by Central TV and Internet. In these challenging times, the one thing that is certain is that the Belize Bank Limited is here for you. There is nothing more important than your health and safety. And we continue to make every effort to make banking safer for you. Our staff is working around the clock to make sure you can do your banking conveniently 24-7 using our mobile banking app and online banking and keeping ATMs up and running. We value your relationship with us and are here to provide the support you need. First responders are also out there 24-7. Thank you, healthcare workers, security forces, firefighters, caregivers. You are all appreciated. Stay safe. We will get through this together. The Belize Bank, our country, your bank. Tonight we take you back down south to Maya Center Village for part two of our story with Julio Saki, the co-owner of Jail Mayan Chocolate. Making authentic and organic chocolate bars is only one aspect of the business. In the following story, we'll show you how this enterprising local chocolate producer has turned the cacao into a zero-waste fruit inside his facility. Here's that story. Chocolate produces over 4,000 chocolate bars per month. This local brand is most known for these traditional chocolates, but they also make other value added products as well as byproducts that are sold at their shop. So, how do they do this? At Chael Mayan Chocolate, nothing goes to waste. This zero waste practice starts from the farm to the factory. On the farm, once the cacao are harvested and the cocoa beans are extracted, the empty pods are returned to the ground where they serve as natural compost for the farm. And once the beans are collected and transferred to the facility for processing, co-owner of Chael Maya Chocolate, Julio Saki, so to begins to look for new ways to add value to his business, increase his bottom line, and provide new products for the market. When we set the beans to, to ferment, 60% to 70% of that is juice that basically goes into waste. And when it goes into waste, you're left with about 32-36% um, of that as dried beans. Now, when, you're, when you have that dried bean in your hand, automatically the price increases. It's no longer the same because you waste a lot of it. Now, my head keeps clicking. How do we come back and 
Well, how do you fetch more money in? Because you paid a lot of money, and because you paid a lot of money for it, that allows your chocolate price to increase. How do I bring down the price of chocolate? This is my main objective. So then I went to the idea, if I begin to use the byproducts, maybe I can sell it a little bit to bring in a little more revenue back into the business. And one of those novel ideas is by creating a drink from fermenting coca beans. And as Saki found out, he can make multiple drinks, including wine and juice. So then I started um, playing with the juice a lot. I will tell you, I am crazy. I am totally. When I started playing with the juice, um, I, I make the wine fairly well because we turn the juice into wine. So what else can I do besides that? So what I've been happening is I've been playing a lot with the cacao juice. So with that now I make a fizz drink almost like a champagne. I, I make that. I am still playing a lot of, a lot of, of, of that um, product. I want to see how much shelf life I can have with it. But I, I, I can make that. I can also make just regular cacao juice by bottling them and you open them and you drink them just like how you drink a Fanta or a, or a mango juice. It's the same thing in bottles. I do have those. I just have to get out there and mass produce it. But I'm, I have been able to do that. <laughs> When the seeds have fermented, they're dried and then roasted, and then they're shelled before they're put into a grinder. But at Chayil Maya Chocolate, those shells don't go in the trash. One night, Saki was producing chocolates by hand when he had a little accident with some hot water. The next day, that presented him with a new opportunity that has resulted in cocoa tea and tea bags. When I walk into this room, just the aroma, just the aroma is like, Wow, what is this? It smells so beautiful, so sweet. I kept looking, searching. I could until when I went to lift that pot to throw outside it, that was what smells so good. So I kept looking at it. Smells good. I said, Oh my goodness, this is really good. So that then propelled me into how do I mass produce it and package it for people now can take it and just use it just like any other tea. That was the beginning of the cacao tea. So with the shells of the cacao beans, we now make cacao tea. But it's not just tea, you know, it's not just the shell. You just don't take the shells and package it because you know what? It's going to get moldy. It's going to go wrong. So we have to go back into fermentation. Just the shells alone have got to go back into fermentation, has got to go back into flavoring, adding the um, natural preservatives from the roots that we use, bring it back out into drying, so it dries out in the facility, and then come into grinding and packaging. So it has a little a whole process by itself. That shell is a major seller. It sells like crazy. Sometimes that's all it gets thick because it doesn't spoil, it doesn't melt, it doesn't go wrong, it keeps for a long time and that is all what they're looking for. So for me that's a major winner. And to get more value from the cacao processing, Saki now produces high quality organic cocoa butter. Another byproduct is this multi-use natural cocoa powder that can be used in pastries, candies and other foods. His experiments and tinkering in the facility also resulted in this instant drink mix. We make the instant chocolate drink. That is something that was also crazy for me because how do I use this waste product? I don't like to see waste. I don't like, we are possibly the only um, um, facility that does not have a, a dump site. We use everything. So after I realized the whole bunch of these um, sediments from the powder, then I said, what can I do with it? Then I started playing a lot with it in, the, in my little room where it's also my lab. I play with a lot of stuff until I came out to that instant hot chocolate mix. Now I can mass produce. So we, we, we also acquired a machine that can pulverize it for us professionally so it looks like it was made from a state-of-the-art factory, not knowing it had come from a small little community where nobody would think magic is happening. But that's not all. Saki is already testing out new ways of how the cocoa bean can be used for some new byproducts. So I'm playing with making the, um, the chocolate sauce, just like how we would do the hot sauce, but in chocolate flavor and then doing the other product that I, I am crazy about is the salad dressing. You know, you buy the Thousand Island in plastics, something like that, but all from cacao. So we make crazy little products, buy products like that, but from, from, the, from the cacao, 
we started uh, just making chocolate. Now we can make other byproducts. And I think for me that is a major winner. It's a major um, uh, winner also for the community because the community is a part of what we're doing. Reporting for News 5, I'm Andrea Polanco. We'll have part three of our story on Thursday. The ASR BSI factory did its final milling around four before it closed temporarily to do some maintenance work. As we reported on Tuesday, the closure is directly related to the impact of the heavy rains and the floods. The sugarcane now has a high mud content, which affects the processing equipment and it has also proven to be a challenge for some farmers to get out their harvest. According to Mac McLaughlin of ASR BSI, they consulted with their stakeholders and had to take the decision. He says they will now use this time to work on the factory so that they're ready to go when the heavy rains subside. You know, we've had unprecedented uh, amounts of rain over the last weekend, as everyone's aware, and uh, uh, clearly that has a major impact on um, on the mill's ability to function, um, both from the perspective of uh, farmers being able to bring cane to the mill, getting it out of fields and bringing it to the, to the mill, and from the mill's perspective on, on uh, managing to mill that, that cane, particularly uh, if it's coming in with a lot of uh, mud and soil uh, and, and other aspects that you might associate with uh, high levels of rainfall. Our aim would be to get back up and running as soon as it's practical to do so. Um, I think there's another weather front coming in uh, this week, it appears, into Belize, so uh, we're, we're watching uh, and waiting to see what happens with that. But in the meantime, uh, you know, the factory um, is, uh, is, not, is not billing cane. Um, but as soon as we can, of course, we'll, we'll resume the crop. We're used to running a 24-7 uh, operation, um, other than times when, when we have uh, stoppages for maintenance. So what we've done in this case you know, we brought forward uh, a maintenance stop, um, which uh, was discussed with the farmer associations. Uh, and, you know, we, uh, we're in the process now of doing some repairs, very much needed repairs on the mill, um, because of the, uh, it's not only the, the, the heavy rainfall that, that's having an impact, but the drought conditions we suffered last year mm -hmm. mean that the quality uh, of, of the cane, uh, not so much the quality of the cane, but certainly the, uh, the mud and, and soil that comes in with the cane has caused us significant problems in milling. We've had a whole series of meetings over the weekend uh, with farmers associations to discuss this uh, advance of the, uh, the maintenance stop, which was at, at the request of, uh, of, of farmers in the first place. Um, and uh, we were given a uh, you know, rough estimate, I guess, of uh, how much cane there was uh, uh, that had been uh, burned um, before, before the rains came in. Um, and the estimate we were given was a, a, just over 5,000 tonnes of cane in, in the field and, uh, uh, that, that needed to come in. So we, we continued to, to grind uh, until actually uh, uh, a good deal later than, than we had originally agreed. Um, and we brought in nearer 7,000 tonnes of, of cane over that period. Uh, but, uh, but at that stage, um, it was important for the sake of, uh, of the mill as well, because uh, the actual quality of that cane coming in, largely due to the weather, was, was very, very poor indeed uh, and was having an impact on, on the mill. I am aware that, uh, that, that there have been a, a number of... Uh, Farmers who who have brought cane after that uh, that sort of cut-off period, which is um, we empathise uh, with with that situation. It's not an easy situation, but um, we were working with uh, estimates that, that we had been given. The heavy rain is but is but only one climate-related issue for the sugar industry. As you'll recall, last year the industry suffered a serious drought, and in the last couple of weeks the low rainfall also signaled in another drought for the country. The back-to-back -back drought has taken a toll on the sugar industry, with predictions that sugar production is expected to be down by 30%. As McLaughlin of ASR BSI explains this, the CEO in the Ministry of Agriculture shares that some relief is coming for the sugarcane farmers in the form of a million U.S. dollars that was promised a while back. What we're trying to do is, is manage, uh, uh, manage very unusual and difficult circumstances uh, for the sugarcane crop in the north. Uh, this is, last year was the, the worst drought 
uh, in the region for 30, 35 years. Um, that's had an impact on the cane. The cane, much of the cane is, uh, is is not as tall as it would normally be. We knew from the outset of this crop that there was likely to be around about a 30% uh, reduction in cane yield as a result of the drought last year. Um, you know, and obviously that, that has an impact on sugar production and, and on the whole industry. Um, it's been a fairly dry period actually up to uh, up to now, and that you know could have implications for the size of the crop next year as well. Um, I think uh, what, what's important is what we're seeing in Belize. That there's, there's a very clear correlation with uh, climate change uh, and the impact of climate change on our crop. You know, we're seeing very, a great variance in weather patterns. Too much rain, not enough rain uh, at the wrong times. And uh, as an industry, I think it's important that uh, we're, we all are looking for longer term solutions to this so that uh, we're not hit by these shocks. Um, from one year to another. But, uh, you know, I mean, what we're, uh, we're keen to do is to, is to get on and, um, you know, manage this crop the best way we can, with, uh, as, as all stakeholders are, farmers, ourselves, uh, and, you know, look forward, hopefully, to, uh, to, to a crop next year that, that would be more in tune with what we've been used to. As you know, after last year's growth, we had, we had allocated resources to assist the livestock sector and the um, vegetable and grain sectors. Those two um, uh, programs were, were completed. We have one um, uh, loan request that, we, that has been put to the CDB for assistance to the sugar industry. Um, that loan has been approved. We're ready for disbursement, but it requires um, approval from the House of Representatives for us to be able to, to obtain the money. Uh, we're hoping that that will be done later this month, so then uh, those payouts as it relates to sugar will be, will be made. Um, as you may know, we are in dialogue with the World Bank right now for a 20, $25 million U.S. dollar loan to assist with climate smart agricultural practices which would assist farmers across the board specifically in addressing the, 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 the changes from um, climate variability and climate change. Many crops are underwater due to recent flooding to tropical storm Cristobal that formed in the Bay of Campeche. Locally, crops and grains are being affected in the west, and as you heard earlier, the sugar industry in the north is also being impacted. Gilbert Canton Jr. says the rains delayed planting of grains, but damage to standing crops was not extensive. It was a very significant rain. We got 14.8 inches on this farm. Uh, it, it, um, it definitely has paused our harvesting on sugarcane. Uh, and on the grain side, it has made it so we have to wait a little while in order to plant our grains. And we've got to do some field repairs and some road repairs. But overall, this, this is... This was very much a needed rain. As you know, there's been a drought uh, for the past couple of years. So uh, even though we have to do some repairs and wait on planting, we're, we're happy with the rain. Now it has caused delays, but how does that ultimately impact your production in terms of maybe getting out uh, what you produce? Sorry. That's, it's a very good point that you bring up uh, because we have very tight cycles. Uh, so we have to get our crop in in June in order to harvest it in October and November and then get another crop in in November, December. So it, it could have an effect. It's hard to say just yet uh, how significant that effect will be because if we dry up right now, uh, then we've got great planting conditions because we'll have our, our water table. We'll all be filled up. Our water profile in the soil will all be filled up. Uh, and then we'll plant and, and, and we'll have great conditions uh, if we get some sun right now. If the rain continues for too long, it could lock us out and cause some issues further down the road. When we come back, sanitation workers at City Hall will be donning professional overalls. We'll show you their new look.
years ago, on June 1st, 1981, the Social Security Board was established as a cornerstone in the foundation for all Belizeans. We exist to serve you through the payment of benefits in times of financial need. To join the program, persons must register and pay contributions in order to secure benefits. A lifetime investment for your future. This year, we celebrate 39 years of service to you in providing these benefits. Short-term benefits, long-term benefits, and employment injury benefits. SSB remains committed to transforming service delivery and enhancing customer experiences for the next 39 years and more. We continue to make progress with the development of Paranza, a new digital platform which aims to better serve you with convenient, secure, and fast online services. Social Security Board, celebrating 39 years of service in Belize. In 2020, the Environmental Protection Pollution from Plastics Regulations were enacted in Belize as a necessary pollution control measure to protect the terrestrial and marine environment from harmful plastic contamination. This does not mean that all plastics are prohibited in the country. The specific items being phased out are single-use styrofoam and plastic, grocery or t-shirt bags, drinking straws, clamshell food containers, bowls, plates, cups, forks, knives and spoons. Please make note of the following dates. After three months after the enactment of the law on April 15, 2020, the importation of prohibited products under the pollution from plastics regulations will not be allowed. After six months on July 15, 2020, the manufacturing of prohibited products will not be allowed. And after nine months on October 14, 2020, the sale of prohibited products will not be allowed. And after 12 months on January 14, 2021, the possession of prohibited products will be an offense. For more details on the list of prohibited products and the permitting system for restricted products, or for a copy of the new regulations, visit the Department of the Environment's website at www.doe.gov.bz. Sanitation workers and operational support staff at the Belize City Council will be donning a professional look. City Hall has acquired overalls and provided them with protective gear to be used when they carry out their work at playgrounds, markets and other areas. Belize City Mayor Bernard Wagner says the initiative was in the making for a year. Here is News 5's Duane Moody. This morning, a brief ceremony was held at City Hall where new uniforms and overalls for the newly minted operational support team of the Belize City Council were unveiled. The project was in the pipeline for over a year and helps to easily identify sanitation workers and other operational workers from the cemetery department, market staff, parks and playground staff, and works. The 200 plus employees were also provided with protective gears as well as equipment needed to carry out their duties. The launch of these new uniforms is something we have worked at diligently because not only do we want our staff to be protected but we need them to be comfortable as well. You will see that the uniform comes in an overall design for our male employees while our female employees will be wearing a matching blouse and pants design. They will also be equipped with gloves, masks and hand sanitizers to keep on their persons at all times as an added safety measure. We are pleased to know that our employees will now be easily identifiable, better protected 
and professionally dressed to suit their roles in their respective departments. 274 uniforms and heavy duty overalls will be issued in the first phase. Mayor Bernard Wagner says that the initiative was undertaken to change the culture and the perception of the sanitation department. They ported workers who carry out duties across the city. We knew that we had to, to change um, the entire culture at City Hall, right? And we wanted to be a culture where our workers are at the forefront and our workers are, are, are recognized each and every day. And we wanted to ensure that our workers um, have the proper attire. It's important. Um, we don't take anything for granted here at City Hall. We, we, we um, really appreciate the great work every day that our workers do on the, in the streets, um, at the cemetery, at the parks and playground. While events of the past two months have exposed the need for safer outfit for our workers in the field, today's launch of these new apparel has been in the planning stages for about an year. And these frontline employees were static about the new apparel, protective gear and equipment that they're receiving because it focuses on their welfare. So far now I could keep my clothes, put it upright, because then you got two outfits for every day. Looking nice, thanks to the mayor. Fix up my look good. Now, Ms. Lynch, after your uh, experience working as a frontline worker through COVID-19, how do you think the uniform is going to help you do your job, and how would it have helped you at that time? Well, like with the uniform right now, after this COVID-19, they are more better, right? Because then we are more covered up completely. Okay, first we never quite cover up everything, but now we have everything quite covered up. Help us to work in a more comfortable and environment, right? And do our job to our best, no? We have the uniform here. Um, we come in our casual clothes. When we get here and we got work to do, then we just change off and, you know, Put on the on the farms, yeah. Dwayne Moody for News 5. Coming up after the break, a house collapses, leaving an unemployed Belize City mother without shelter during the pandemic. As stay-at-home orders will gradually loosen across the country and you slowly go back to doing what you do best, Magna Visual has prepared a new lineup of COVID care products that can give employees and guests peace of mind with an extra layer of defense as they transition back to daily life outside quarantine. Prepare your facilities and keep your employees and visitors safe and healthy. Yeah, where to go out? Where my dog? Yeah, at the corner, at the corner. Everybody has that one loyal friend. Brits, you could pick up the girl for me? I can't, I'll check out. I could borrow your tennis. Mm. This one pretty, please. I could borrow my medication. <sighs> Loyalty doesn't have to be this hard. With Smart's new Stars and Rewards loyalty program, prepaid customers get star points easily. Every time you make a call, purchase a bundle, or upload credit, you get rewarded. With these points, you can stack them up and get awesome rewards like free data, free SMS minutes, and extra on uploads plus lots more. So the more you use, the more you get. And if you want to check your reward stars, just download the Smart app, enter the My Account portal, or send a free SMS to Zone. That's 9663. And in the body, write rewards. Then you can enjoy the loyal life. Smart, your full service telecom provider. As one of the largest cable and internet providers in Belize, CBC strives to provide our customers with the highest standards of quality, value, and service in all aspects of cable TV and internet. Monitoring our systems closely, our technicians combine creative planning and state-of-the-art technology with years of experience and training to develop and provide the most reliable and advanced cable and internet service to exceed your expectations. For CBC and our team of talented engineers, technicians, and customer service representatives, delivering less than the very best is never an option.
challenging times, the one thing that is certain is that the Belize Bank Limited is here for you. There is nothing more important than your health and safety. And we continue to make every effort to make banking safer for you. Our staff is working around the clock to make sure you can do your banking conveniently 24-7 using our mobile banking app and online banking and keeping ATMs up and running. We value your relationship with us and are here to provide the support you need. First responders are also out there 24-7. Thank you, healthcare workers, security forces, firefighters, caregivers. You are all appreciated. Stay safe. We will get through this together. The Belize Bank, our country, your bank. A meeting was held on Tuesday afternoon between the Christian Workers Union and the Port of Belize Limited. It was mediated by the Labor Department and focused on a three-day interruption at the port. On Saturday morning, stevedores decided to support trailers because they could not work the ship. But it is all resolved on Tuesday and work resumed. Pre President of the Christian Workers Union, Evan Mose Hyde, explains. Well, the outcome of the meeting is that tomorrow morning the loading of the sugar is going to resume at 6 a.m. and trailers will be allowed to work. Uh, that is agreed upon that the concerns of PBL where they would want to regularize the list of trailers accepting that trailers are a part of the ecosystem down at the waterfront. Uh, we are going to engage in discussions that will regularize the process, uh, at least some kind of compromise. In the meantime, the trailers are on, or I should say the trailers are once again uh, able to go, and so the stevedores felt they are okay to resume dealing with the march. The family of th a family of three was at home on Tuesday night when their house came crumbling down. Talia Westby and her two sons have been living in the small wooden house on Baldwin Street in Belize City for two years, but the heavy rains have damaged the beams, causing them to cave in. The single mother has also lost her job and is desperately in need of help. Here is News 5's Dwayne Moody with this report. A single mother and her two young children were displaced on Tuesday night when the wooden structure they called home collapsed off its beams. Thalia Westby and her sons, ages 11 and 9, were about to have supper when they began hearing creaking sounds coming from the flooring. She ignored the sounds, but was later alerted by a visiting son that the beams were giving way. Wesby and her sons got out moments before the house went down, just before 8 p.m. We heard a noise and I was wondering if the posts are giving way at the time, right? But I just kept listening and my son came to visit us because he was going to stay with us last night. Um, he stepped on the first steps, right? And he heard the noise increasing. So um, he told me, Mom, come out, you know, come out, come out. So I just left everything there and we just come out and we just watched the house just fall, fall down. It would have collapsed with us in there because I, I wasn't paying at, attention too much. I just heard a little noise and I, I said, but that not sound normal. So uh, just me, um, my 11 year old and my nine year old was there. It's one little house and you know, you're not really part of, but um, we, my kids didn't sleep on their own bed and I sleep on my own bed. Uh, it's home. Yeah, it's home yeah. for us, you know. Um, so everything I try, was destroyed when it went down? Or I'm not sure what all destroyed in there because I tried to go in there this morning. Um, far off what I could see, some, the, the refrigerator door is open, everything out there came out. And when I tried to walk on the floor, it, it felt like it's going to collapse more. So I, I, I haven't gotten any 
clothes out there as yet or nothing because I'm afraid that uh, yeah. the roof come down on, on me. The family has been living in the structure for about two years now. It is located to the rear of the property owned by Wesby's mother. The wooden house, however, was built over a marshy area of the property and it is believed that the recent rains exacerbated the condition of the beams which elevated the house. I guess because it, it rains a lot lately, it holds more water than usual because at the back there that like swamp you know and I think it's well I think it root up the posts because when I checked this morning um, the posts look like they some of them root up and the others br um, broken the neighbors wanted to come and help but they are afraid that they get charged with a curfew um, so I just left everything there in the house I just tried went and oh. try find somewhere to my for my kids to sleep um, what um, hurt me more that my kids had to came out of the house last night in the ring in the the water down there um, it, it, it hurt me that I I try to do the best I could with my kids and try provide for them for now Wesby and her sons are living with one of her sisters she had lost her job from a BPO prior to the lockdown as a result of COVID-19 and has not been able to find employment she's asking for assistance to re-erect the home and possibly add landfill I try seek uh, assistance with stuff to fill the yard um, and I don't get no help with that um, I try um, they, I know that the hurricane season, they, they, they come up and I try to see how I could get assistance with the post to try to reinforce it more and I don't get no help with that. So I try to see how I could get secondhand stuff so that I can um, do it myself because I not see that I don't get any help. I, you know, <laughs> so, exhausting. So. I, um treat really to try process this in you know, my head the whole to try take down this house by myself because finance I don't have the finance to do it and I don't know how I want to do it yet but I hope that God help me I will go ask for God help me and open ways to me and so that I could build back for me and my kids. I would uh, appreciate if I could get stuff to fill the yard mainly and if they could help me rebuild the house, maybe with the same material, I wouldn't mind. If God bless me with a new home, I would appreciate that too. Um, but I just want something that we, me and my kids could go back and live in there and, you know, and secure. Dwayne Moody for News 5. Anyone who would like to assist Westby and her family can contact her at cell phone number 625-5543. Last week we brought you the story of Harmony Young, a 16-year-old Belize City resident who was diagnosed with a benign brain tumor back in March of this year. Her health condition deteriorated rapidly and she was in need of urgent medical care. Her aunt, who is her guardian, partnered up with the Belize Brain Awareness Society to raise funds and gather the requisite documents for Young to travel to Guatemala. But taking her via air ambulance was not possible and with her condition worsening, the surgery had to be undertaken in Belize. On Tuesday, neurosurgeon Dr. Javier Dupi performed a surgery on the teenager at the Carl Hishner Memorial Hospital. The young girl remains in a coma in the intensive care unit as she recovers from what is considered to be a successful procedure. Charmaine Augustus says that at this time, Harmony is in need of blood. She did her surgery yesterday. It was completed around um, minutes to four. So she came out. So far, everything is well. She's currently in ICU. Um, asleep still because the brain needs to be rest the brain needs to be the brain needs to rest so that she doesn't have anything agitating her so the swelling needs to go down and so forth okay however she is in need of blood yes she is in need of blood and prayers everybody so please continue sending your prayers and support the family needs the support right now and blood any type of blood will do her blood type is actually b b positive but any blood will do at this time how can someone help in donating blood to her um, they go to the blood bank or you can do it at any hospital in the district where you're at 
and just tell them that you're donating towards Harmony Young and then what they will do, they will call into the blood bank in Belize City and then we can pick up the slip from them. I'm a believer in the Most High, so I kept myself calm and my family calm as well and kept Harmony as positive as possible. And she's also a believer. Her favorite thing is God is good. God is always good. So we just kept reminding her and she prays often. We remind her to pray in your mind, pray and just continue to pray. So for both of us, it was a smooth transition actually. She wasn't scared. I walked her through every step in preparation for the, for the surgery. COVID-19 has left many families disenfranchised across the country. While some have joined the unemployment pool and are dependent on relief from government, others are unable to meet rent, pay their bills, and purchase basic necessities. But every bit helps, so the Young Women's Christian Association has launched a feminine hygiene product drive as an initiative to assist women and young girls as COVID-19 continues to wreak havoc. According to General Secretary of the YWCA, Diana Gomez, it is to ensure that adolescent girls in particular have access to basic hygienic necessities. The idea behind it is to ensure that our women during this very difficult time are not disenfranchised, basically. So um, menstruation is a normal part of a woman's life. Um, we want to make sure that our women and our girls are not um, left behind because they're going through a natural process. So we know this is a hard times and difficult times where people are scrambling to make to find enough to be able to eat. Mm -hmm. And that was the focus for a long time, if they had enough food to eat. But we're figuring now that we need to focus on the other important things that would help, that would handicap a woman or a girl. And as an institution that caters to women and girls, we want to make sure we're in the forefront with that. So this has been something that we've been thinking about for a while. And we think now is as good a time as any. Hurricane season is here. We're on the well. We're still in COVID. Um, we we seem to think that we're out of COVID, but we're not. And um, people are strained for resources. And I would hate to think that there are girls out there who are kept at home, can't do what they need to do, or um, treated differently and not feeling healthy or hygienic because they don't have the products they need to um, to do what they need to do. We're asking for soap, shampoo, um, pads. Panty liners, um, powder, I, I throw in sablan and detol because women use that for, as an antibacterial for different things. Um, toothpaste, toothbrush, so those types of things. So we want the basics that will help a woman to maintain her hygiene. Drop-offs can be made at YWCA offices in Belize City and Belmopan. If it is a large donation, the institution can organize a pickup. And that's the news. Don't forget that tonight's broadcast is available in both text and streaming video at channel5belize.com. You can also connect with us on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash News 5 Live. I'm Marlene Poyar. Thanks for joining us. And from all of us here at News 5, please remember to wash your hands. Keep your social distance. Stay safe. Good night.